As we slowly emerge from the shadow of colonization, the work I must do as a member of the folks who were formerly colonized is daily work. I grew up in a very emotional and empathetic child in a household where generational trauma left wounds that remained unhealed in both of my parents. And as a result, they were ill-equipped to deal with my confusion and rage at being told that I was equal and free. And yet my reality of being a queer black girl in the United States felt spiritually the opposite. This rage exploded out of me and was channeled into my creative endeavors like dance and singing and reading fantasy novels, which was not seen as overall productive. How could I dance my way out of poverty? My creative expression was treated as a childhood indulgence unable to carry the weight of my family towards a brighter future as this was my job as the firstborn. My father was born shortly after World War II in Jim Crow, Alabama and lost both his parents before the age of 35. He was one of 10 siblings and would tell me stories of entering movie theaters through back doors and keeping his eyes down as white people walked past him on the sidewalk. He moved to Chicago, United States during what is called the Great Migration. The Great Migration was the movement of more than 6 million African-Americans from the Southern United States to the North of the country between the years of 1917 and 1970. However, Many, like my father, soon realized that the dangers they had escaped in the South were not confined there. I mentioned my father's story to highlight that, in my view, the efforts of my father's generation and those before him were to free the body and survive, whereas our work, our work lies more in thriving the mind and the soul, how to move past survival into sustained thriving. Although all three spaces, the marginalized mind, body and soul are constantly under attack and these spaces of work continue to overlap. For more on this idea, please watch the interesting 1971 conversation between James Baldwin and Nikki Giovanni. Simply by being born under the shadow of white supremacy in the United States, there were so many myths that I learned about myself and my people. These myths combined with homophobia and cultural roles like the oldest sibling takes care of everyone work together in concert to give me a hazy picture of my sense of self. What was my worth if I could not actively use my back to protect others at all times? Myth. If I could, I would tell little Lucretia that it's okay to rest. You don't have to save everyone to be worthy. Until I was 11 or 12, I used to pray every night for blue eyes and blonde hair, religiously. I'm not sure what made me stop. When I was a freshman in high school, we read Toni Morrison, who wrote The Bluest Eye. In it, the main character, Piccola, a young girl, also prays for the same thing. I was shocked. It was the first time I remember being seen in a piece of literature. And I was also flabbergasted naively that someone else had the same fervent wish as me across time. 
and it appeared in literature. Up until that point, I hadn't read the mind of characters who were so thoroughly colonized like myself. Although I wouldn't have described it like that at the time. This was a myth. If I could, I would tell little me that brown eyes are also a color, just as beautiful and can see just as well. In her 2013 book, Sister Citizen, Melissa Harris Perry speaks about the crooked room. This part of her thesis explains growing up a cisgender heterosexual woman, and you can add more crookedness for each marginalized intersection you cross. So that's mental illness, having a disability, et cetera. And growing up like this in your crooked room in the United States is having a distorted sense of self. Living in this room can contort your view of reality. You believe you are strong. You believe you are standing straight. But in reality, you have bent yourself all out of shape to survive and move past the stereotypes that are thrust on you. In my case, Black women and girls are angry, oversexed, welfare queens, prudes, too submissive, all at the same time. Now, at this point in my life, I finally feel like I'm closer to standing up straight again, although it has not come without struggles. Like many of my generation, as I mentioned in the poem you just listened to, we are a generation that has moved back in with our families out of necessity rather than choice. The dreams that we were told would come to pass if we worked hard and went to college have not materialized as the cost of living outpaces our earning power and union membership is at an all time low. It is or was a badge of honor to work ourselves to death in order to make, our, make sure our student loans are paid while also trying to live, to love, to just exist, all while making sure our lives are presented on social media, which functions as so many things. It can be a vital tool or it can be a crutch. Moving back in with your parents and confronting the childhood ghosts around your family home is painful. And I can only speak for myself. The way out is through, I'm learning. It's to sit with myself and ask which of these lies I have been told about myself that I will carry into the future. Which parts of myself have I left behind when I was told to put away childish things and grow up? Which parts did I leave behind because Black people don't X? Play, joy, rest, creativity, embodiment. These gifts I possessed abundantly as a child. And now I feel it is to them I must return in order to heal and to grow. How will I show up in the community that I have chosen to be a part of? The community that I found within Unitarian Universalism isn't perfect. I can accept with sadness that there is anti-Blackness everywhere and within myself. However, the creativity that I possess, the spirituality that I possess is mine. It cannot be contained within one tradition. It is the plurality of our project, this Unitarian Universalism that I think doesn't exist yet, that so far has been so life-giving to me. What if we did meet people where their gifts are? What if we actually allowed ourselves space to heal from childhood wounds and to step into our strengths? What type of world could we create if we acted in harmony with our gifts and with each other? If we created the world we wanted, not out of competition, but 
out of a place of abundance. May it be so. Blessed be. Ashe.